taking the form of Guan Yin, find shelter for the homeless. We were sitting with that koan. I got an image of something like a bus stop. It wasn't very big. And it was clear glass. So there was a little overhang, just a little bit of shelter. And then I noticed, I thought of images of times when I've felt homeless came to my mind. And I thought of when I was young, um, in high school, and my parents were in turmoil and fleeing here and there. And I wanted to stay with something I knew and I wanted to stay in the town I lived in, but I didn't have a place that I could be. And so I asked everybody I knew, like, could I stay with you? You know, could I stay at your house? Do you know any place I could stay? I lived in this kind of conservative small town. Um, <laughs> nobody was, nobody lived in other people's houses, whatever. It's kind of a crazy idea. Um, but I kept asking and I almost ended up in this one place um, where an older woman had a, had a room that was like a walkthrough room and I could have maybe been in that room. And I felt luckily for me that didn't happen. One day I asked a girl at the bus stop and, um, and she said, well, maybe you could stay with us. You could stay at my house. And a long story short, I did end up staying at this person's house for a couple of years um, in her brother's room uh, most of the time, except when he came home. And then I went in the basement and uh, his room had wallpaper of tigers and had like all his books in it he was just off at college you know and that sense i just felt that sense of like going around and asking kind of like are you my mother can i are you my home um when i was in college i one day took uh mushrooms with somebody i was convinced to do this and it seemed an unwise move. Uh, once we did this, and I was not that experienced with it, I realized this was not the person I should be with, and this was not the place I should be. And they were uh, good enough to let me leave them. And then what I did is I, I wandered all over town, knocking on the doors of everybody I knew, thinking if I could just find a friend to like hang with me till this is over. <laughs> And no one was home. And, I, and, and in my mind and in my memory, everything I, every, I just, I knocked on door after door after door and nobody was home. And so when you were sitting with the koan, perhaps some, some images came to you or maybe some thoughts, maybe some feelings about what is it like to be homeless? And what is it like to be at home? And maybe you thought, maybe you didn't, those things didn't occur to you at all. And you were thinking about the football game coming up after the program. And maybe you had the idea, an idea about, you know, what you were thinking or feeling. Um, all of those things are for you. You can't really have the wrong images come to you. You know, when you're listening to a talk and you notice that sometimes you're really paying attention or like, Tess will say something like, I really like the story of the young girl who led guided meditations for her mother and how she did that. And I was like, wow, that really jumped out at me. And I think there were other times maybe I wasn't hearing so much. And that's what happens. And that's like, 
that's actually, that's it. Like that's, that's your real life. And one of the things, so on the subject of home, um, you might know, I too, I just, I just bought a house and it's the first house I've ever bought. And it's absolutely, um, what I want to say, I guess, is that in connection with it, I've been thinking about how much life, um, I had a, I would have liked to have a home earlier. You know, I'm doing this with my partner who's even older than me and I'm not young and it's really difficult. It's, just, it's really hard. And we really would have been, thought that a good idea would have been to do this a lot earlier. Um, and we tried actually, especially him. Um, but it just didn't happen. And then all of a sudden now we have a home. And yesterday, so so we both have full-time jobs. And so we're, we, we bought this little place that we could afford and we love the land and it's really beautiful. And we basically are like tearing it apart and trying to rebuild it <laughs> in our spare time of which we don't have a whole lot. And yesterday, so yesterday I, um, well, actually the day before yesterday, so yesterday we were gonna go up to the house and we had these things we needed to do. And one of those things was, we have ordered uh, a special pickup of large bulky items on Monday. And um, so we were gonna move this old mattress and box spring and chair and couch to the road. And we had to say specifically like what the items were and you know get them out there Saturday for pickup tomorrow. So Friday, I get a call from a friend who's just calling to say hello. And then they say, oh, you know, if you ever need to borrow my truck, um, you know, you could do that and that'd be fine. And I go, oh yeah, how about tomorrow? <laughs> and uh, and so anyway, this, this nice friend actually lent us their truck yesterday and we used it to take some things to the dump. <clears throat> <clears throat> and also to do this task of moving these really heavy items to the front street. And um, all the time I was doing this, I was thinking, what did we think? What did we think we were going to do without this truck? There was no way. We have a, like a little SUV, would never fit any of these items in it. And we're not stupid. Like we usually plan ahead and think and like, and yet in this instance, we had this plan that these things had to get to the road and no mechanism by which it was gonna happen. And in this particular case, something appeared and it was this truck. And that doesn't mean that like the truck had to appear, like maybe the truck might not have appeared and then something else would have happened. Um, <laughs> But so there was another thing about the, the experience of, of borrowing the truck. Um, so I was really appreciative of this truck. And um, so we got the truck. The truck, of course, was like full of gas. The meter was absolutely at full. You know, it was a kind thing that someone would do, lend you a truck. Um, and we, it was great, it was perfect, it was wonderful, and it was time to return it. And all my programming about sort of how do you show gratitude and how do you find yourself in community was like, well, the first thing we should definitely fill up the truck with gas, you know, so that will, not like the person needs this money, but just as a way of like doing what I'm supposed to do. But then I didn't end up doing that because it would have made us late and it was like whatever so then we arrive to return the truck and we pull in and we hear this crunch and there had been these um we drove right over these uh like drainage pipe things that were running across their driveway and it was dark and they had this beautiful house and we were kind of admiring the house and we destroyed like this thing that was there right so we're doing well here 
So then, um, what else did we do? I guess we were driving home and then we realized, oh, we hadn't like reorganized something for them that we were supposed to, supposed to do. And then I started thinking, well, gosh, they were so nice and maybe I wasn't very thoughtful in my conversation that I had with them. And I was trying to fix it with my friend. I started sending texts like, I'm so sorry and thank you so much and all of this stuff. And, and um, none of that was helping. And what I wanted to say about this is, so this was an example of that trying to, trying to um, manage how things went, manage my place, manage my place and my relationships and stuff. And I'm getting a little bit lost in what I'm trying to say here. It's like what's underneath it. What I'm trying to say is that everything Everything is happening underneath, despite all of what we think are our efforts. And our efforts aren't useless or meaningless. They're like a key way in which everything is happening. But what gets in the way and causes less, it causes suffering and causes sort of less fluidity is the ideas about whether we're doing it right and whether this is the way it's supposed to go, and the idea that we should have it figured out and know how to, how to make our friends like us and know how to get a house at the right time and know how to be accepted and know how to be a good Zen student and know how to give a talk and know all of these things. And, and while, in, while they're all sort of things we can learn about and maybe do a little bit better, in a certain way and on a certain level, it's like deep underneath, and this is the silence before, you know, the silence, the great silence. It's, it's, it's not about that. The thing that really holds you and really keeps you at home is not about whether, how it turns out, how you're doing, whether you're doing it right or wrong. It's just simply not about that. And I was recently in a conversation and somebody was talking about that, um, you know, uh, you often will hear somebody say in a Dharma talk, you know, this moment is enough. What's happening is enough. Whatever you have here is enough. And this morning I got into my car and the thought came to me, and whatever you have is also not enough. And sometimes when you think about that, that the opposite is already true, Instead of that, that's not a problem. It's like it's freeing because you realize, yeah, in a certain way, it's not enough and never will be enough. And so why keep trying in that small little way? You know, it's like, what is enough? Enough in what? Enough. And it just, everything, it just is. And if you're not trying to make it enough or not enough, then you have a, a better chance of seeing what it is. And what has life got in store for you despite all of your plans and all of the things that you think it should be doing. You know, you are part of it. Everything about life is coming through you. So, so it's like it's not your, maybe like practice what might be sort of your responsibility is to pay attention and notice. But it's not to make it turn out a certain way, you know. It's like to see, well, what wants to come through? And what is actually here outside of my opinions about it? It's, but like the less we, even with my house, you know, I keep, I'm afraid of things going well. And I kind of like this house. And I'm really hoping that I'm going to get to move in and, and we're going to live there and be really happy. And then there's a part of me that that very bringing up that image makes me afraid something bad will happen. And I have to keep reminding myself, well, I have it right now. Like what I have right now, this is, this is good. I, I'm enjoying what I'm doing and it's, and it's enough. I, uh, I was looking at my computer and I found this thing. Um, I think John Tarrant wrote a long time ago. And, and read uh, at the opening of 
an integrative medicine building like 15 years ago. And I'm going to share it with you. Um, it was called Healing is Like Kissing. And um, because they were doctors and they were healing. And I thought, and I read it and I thought, well, that could also be, you just substitute life for healing in this poem. And so I'm going to read it. And I'm going to say life. Take your pick, which word you hear. Life is like kissing. It can be done mechanically on the way to somewhere you think is more interesting. But it's best done for its own sake. Like breathing, like looking at the person in front of you, as if they were the only one in the world, which at this moment they are. Life, you might think, is a whir of beautiful machines, and that's fine. But for me, it means I stop and don't rush about so much. Life is a question, too. Something like, granting the difficulty of this world, what do I really want? And the answer turns out to be everything. The running boy, the owl calling at midnight, the white perfumed narcissus pushing up through snow, the afternoon blue and then a thin translucent yellow, this evening, this morning that we have together. I want what's happening now. What I want is for the world to kiss me back. And with that, I turn it over to Allison.